Okay, we're looking at that heretic. He is Akhenaten, the, Akhenaten or Amenhotep IV. He started off as Amenhotep IV, but changed his name about five years into his reign. Okay, look at the dates, 1353 BCE to about 1336 BCE. Um, before we start this, we've got to remind ourselves about the priests of Amun. Uh, the priests were the ones that held back the forces of, of nature, chaos. Okay, they kept the world turning. They kept the sun rising in the east. They were seen as re being very powerful. They didn't pay taxes. They had uh, this political power. Um, the priests were very wealthy, okay, wealthier than the Pharaoh, in fact. And their political power is equal to that of the Pharaoh, if not greater than the Pharaoh. And so you have these two competing forces, the Pharaoh and you have the, the priests. One, you know, it's, it's kind of gives you a two-headed monster. And so it will affect how Egypt develops and it will affect what the Pharaoh can and cannot do. Okay, but before we get to that, the 18th dynasty too. Amenhotep, the, the, Amenhotep Amun is satisfied these names. The names are very important because the names of the Pharaohs actually have the names of their God within them. Okay, Amun is, um, Amun is satisfied, Amunhotep. Uh, and so you have that Pharaoh is dedicated to that God Amun, Tutmos, Okay, he is, um, Thoth has risen. Okay, that, that pharaoh is dedicated to the god Thoth. Uh, when we get down to Akhenaten, he changes his name. Okay, Aten, A-T-E-N, or A-T, yeah, E-N. Uh, he is looking at the Aten being the most important god. So the names have clues as to which god they see as most preeminent. Um... And we will talk about names a little bit later, too, in a different presentation. Now, the wives of the 18th dynasty, okay? What is interesting about the wives is they are not always the sister of the pharaoh. They are frequently a cousin or distant or someone who might be related through a noble family. In fact, Amenhotep III, his, his wife, his primary wife was T. Um, she was the daughter of a charioteer officer, uh, Tia, Yuya and Tuya. Uh, Yuya was, um, I think, the dad, and Tuya was the mom, and they had the daughter, T. Now, T was Amenhotep III's favorite wife, his primary wife, not his sister. Now, when he, they had this, their son, Akhenaten, he married one of his cousins, Nefertiti, and you can see her name there, just above my picture, but Akhenaten, okay, initially his name was Amenhotep IV. Um, but he changed it about five years into his rule, but his, so he had more than one wife. Now, again, the primary job of a Pharaoh or a King all through history has been to produce an heir. If you do not produce an heir, uh, your world might go into civil war. And so you have to have a son to be a Pharaoh. You have to have a daughter that will bear the next Pharaoh. Uh, when we look at Ramses, uh, I do that because Ramses is, He's, we have to look at him. Uh, we'll look at him next week sometime. But he had to produce a, a, an error, and he goes to extreme lengths to get that error. Now, we get this all set up, okay? Akhenaten should give you a clue that when he changes his name, but this is going to be a different world, okay? Now, what Amenhotep IV inherited from Amenhotep III was a highly organized kingdom, very modern. Think about uh, they had diplomatic letters being sent back and forth. In fact, in the 1800s, they discovered 382 of these tablets. They're written in canoe form, and these were letters, documents that were sent back and forth. Uh, this might be the copies, the photocopies of the uh, letters that were being sent back and forth because they were letters to other kings, uh, the Hatties, the different kings of Mesopotamia, um, making sure that they didn't go to war, that they had established trade they could keep peace, that they were sending daughters back and forth as um, peace treaties, okay? Now, the pharaohs never sent their daughters because they didn't want the kings of Mesopotamia to have a claim to the Egyptian throne. And so they kept their daughters home because the blood of the pharaoh was carried to the daughter. Uh, but they would take girls and daughters from Mesopotamia uh, to father other kids with and to honor their peace treaty. Now, one of the letters actually talks about 
how they want a the pharaoh to send a fake daughter. Just send me a girl and say it's your daughter. Um, but the pharaohs wouldn't even do that. They wouldn't send any Egyptian girls outside the country. Because if they did, if they sent a fake daughter, that fake daughter might have a fake pharaoh who has a fake claim to the throne and would cause a real war. And so they kept their daughters home. They didn't send them out. Uh, so this is the world that Akhenaten inherits. Okay, you got the powerful priests. You have this rich diplomatic world. And it's just, I mean, it would be fascinating to go back and look at. Now, about 1348 BCE, Akhenaten changes his name to Akhenaten. And he takes the god, the Aten, and he raises uh, the Aten up to the, be the supreme god of the land. And he also takes the other gods, Amun, Thoth, Hathor, all these other gods, and he suppresses them all. He closes their temples. He won't let any of the, the priests practice their um, bathing of the gods, taking, you know, collecting offerings, that sort of thing. And so Akhenaten becomes the first true monotheist. In fact, he takes the capital from Thebes, where the uh, Karnak, that big temple is, and he moves it about 200 miles north to a, a, an empty spot of land. In fact, the boundary totems or the boundary posts of this new city say that this land was not occupied by any other people, no other gods, nothing before the Aten had a city built there. And when Aten moves his capital up to Amarna, uh, he dedicates this entire city to the worship of the Aten. Uh, in fact, the, I, I believe Akhenaten means the horizon of the sun. And I think that might be the name of the city as well. Uh, modern day people call it Amarna or Tel Amarna. Um, now, Amarna had three different sections. You had the northern section, and that's where Akhenaten had his primary palace. Uh, and his primary palace was not really just a house for him. In fact, his house was in the back. He had apartments in the back where he, he lived. The front part, the palace part of the palace, was a dedication or a worship center for Aten. Um, now, the center part of the city, that's where the government offices were. In fact, this is where they found those Amarna letters, all those tablets. Uh, they kept the records, they did all the, the bureaucracy there, um, but they also had temples to the Aten. Uh, this city was set up for worshiping the Aten too, and I believe they had different areas where, like a bridge over a um, square where the Aten or Akhenaten would go and address the people. Akhenaten was the high priest as well as the pharaoh. Uh, let's see what else. Now, there is some debate whether Akhenaten did this to either break the priest of Amun, which is possible, or he may have been truly dedicated to the Aten. Um, and it, there's evidence and theories that push both ways. Um, we could be skeptical. Uh, he could have been a, a devout monotheist and really truly believed in the Aten, or he could have just been very politically savvy and wanted to you know, destroy the, the Amun cult and put his own power ahead of everyone else. One thing during the, the Amarna period, though, is he does seem to neglect his international duties. He doesn't correspond with the other kings nearly as much. And so there is kind of a degradation of the empire uh, at that point. Okay, and in fact, his empire will come to an end shortly after he dies. Uh, we'll look at um, Tutankhamun. Uh, but after Tutankhamun rules, there's only another emperor or another pharaoh. Uh, in fact, it's one of the people he knows. I think it's Rem Remheb and I that actually take power for a little bit uh, before the 18th dynasty ends. And so his his is the last real strong part of the 18th, 18th dynasty. Now, the art of the Amarna period. This is fascinating because the art gives us some clues as to what their life was like too. When you look at the nature paintings of the Amarna period, nature is very lifelike. Flowers look like flowers, birds look like, look like birds, animals look like animals. People don't necessarily look so, so, uh, like, so much like people. They're very stylized. Uh, they have big hips, big butts, long narrow arms, legs and fingers, I mean long skinny stuff. They have long faces and very Big, big heads or skulls that go, that go way back. Now, some people think that this was done because Akhenaten may have looked strange. 
if you looked at his statue up above, he does have a very long, narrow face, but that's the only thing that is out of the norm. Okay, it's really not even out of the normal very much, but that is a very long, narrow face. Now, some people think that he may have had this disease called Marfan syndrome. Now, Marfan syndrome is a disease of the connective tissue. It's where your internal organs do not connect very well to your body, and so you could have some um, problems. In fact, there was a, a, a kid that died here in Pullman probably about 10 years ago. Uh, he had Marfan syndrome. And it, it does give you long, narrow fingers and arms, big butts, uh, big thighs, that sort of thing. So it does look like it could have been like they've depicted. Now, here's some of the pictures I want to show you right now. There are the ducks I was telling you about, okay, and the swamp. Okay, this looks very much like it is a nature scape. In fact, this is, I like it. It looks pretty cool. I'd buy it if it was cheap. Uh, but it's a, a very natural looking art piece. Okay, this is a uh, relief of Akhenaten and his family worshiping the Aten. Now, the Aten is that disc here, and the rays of the Aten come down, their little hands that caress the people and take care of the people. But when you look at uh, Akhenaten here, he has a big butt, big thighs, long, narrow fingers, or legs, arms, and fingers, long, skinny neck, weirdly shaped head. And the other people in this are also depicted like that. And so it's puzzling. Now here's another picture. This is Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti, his primary wife, and two of his daughters. And Akhenaten is kissing his daughter, which is not a typical activity that would be shown a pharaoh as doing. Uh, pharaohs weren't shown being family people. They were you know, shown conquering enemies and uh, stamping out other people. And so there is a definite break between Akhenaten and Aunhotep. Akhenaten seems to be much more of a family man. Um, now, there you have the Aten, and the kids look very strange. Okay? Nefertiti and Akhenaten look very similar to each other. Big butts, long skinny legs and arms, and long necks. But um, the kids also are very stylized. They have the big, strange-looking heads. And their bodies are kind of like human-sized bodies, but on miniature people, right? Um, now, this is a sculpture from a uh, the Amarna period, and you can see the head really protrudes out back. And this is not the only one like this. In fact, King Tut's skull it does protrude a little bit, but not as much as this. If you ever see his his mummy, uh, his skull is detached from his body, and his the back of his head does go back further than the average person. Now, this is Nefertiti. Now, Nefertiti, she is perhaps the most beautiful woman from ancient Egypt because we don't have any other pictures to compare with, right? But she has a long neck, uh, thin, elegant features, but nothing looks outside the normal. In fact, uh, if Nefertiti lived nowadays, she would look like any other person with a cool hat. A little necklace but her physical features are very much normal uh, i actually saw this in person when i went to berlin uh, we were in one of the museums and she has a room all to herself and it her her bust this statue of her head it's amazing um really cool to think that we can still see things that are about 3500 3300 years old really cool okay now, here's what you got to discuss and think about. We'll talk about this before I turn you guys loose. Do you think Akhenaten was devoted to the Aten for religious or political reasons? There's evidence that supports both, but what do you think? Okay. Now, if, and this is an if question, I'm not sure if it's you know, uh, real, if this really happened, but if the cult of Amun kept Egypt from building more pyramids and monuments, are they a positive or negative influence on Egypt? Okay. We have this two-headed dragon. You have the pharaoh and you have the cult of Amun. If the pharaoh was in power by himself, perhaps the pharaoh would have taken Egypt more conquering, building a bigger empire, building more monuments. Who knows what would have happened. But we have the cult of Amun. And so a lot of the resources, a lot of the political power is going to be separated between the pharaoh and the cult. And those resources are going to be separated too. And so perhaps 
they take Egypt in a different direction. Okay, is that positive or negative? I don't know. It's up to you to decide. Now, Akhenaten created some reforms. Is that a negative or positive effect on the accomplishments of Egypt? And we haven't really looked at the accomplishments of Egypt very much, but what do you think is going to happen? Okay, are these things going to be great for Egypt or negative for Egypt? In our understanding of it. Okay, think about those things. We'll come back and talk about it. Uh, if you have any questions, stick around. I'll talk to you or uh, come see me in office hours. Take care.